Well, hello, and thank you for joining me for this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor, and we're at, at episode 19. I'm trying to crank these out as fast as I can. So I've got a quick update show today, so let me get right into it. One of, now, one of the uh, interesting articles, and once in a while I come across some interesting articles here, is from um, a site called Clean Technica. I love them. I'm always looking at a lot of stuff they do. And they had this interesting article that was from about a city in Spain, and it's called Life in a City Without Cars. And it was pretty interesting because if you travel to lots of places outside of North America, because it's not that common in North America, but certainly in Europe, it's very big and in other other countries where the downtown areas of cities and towns are pretty well car free or very minimalistic from car presence perspective because it's open for pedestrian and it's open for business and, and other uh, shops and venues to for pedestrians to see. So this is a an example of a city. Um, it's a city in northwestern Spain called Ponte Verde. And uh, there was a mayor by the name of Miguel Lores, and he took power in 1999. And one of the things that he was thinking about when he was looking at his downtown uh, center of this uh, city, which has a population of about 80,000 people, maybe slightly more by now, and they did some stats and they noticed that about 14,000 cars passed his street every day and ran throughout the city. And they, um, even though there's that many cars going through, they were having economic challenges with the downtown core of the city. And I've seen that a lot of other places too, including locally here in Ontario. Um, the city was in decline, it was polluted, there was lots of traffic accidents, not a lot of uh, people coming down to support the businesses and so forth. They did a public uh, consultation to talk to the public about getting rid of cars in the downtown core, and it actually went over very well. So what the city did is they eliminated um, all the parking spaces in the downtown area and they paved over the streets and they put granite blocks and, and um, different types of things to walk on for pedestrian walkways or what they call pedestrian malls. And now what happens in this city is that people park on the outside of the outskirts of this area and they walk or take they take public transit. So the minimal transit that is allowed is public based from that perspective. Um, and it's not a very long walk. I think it takes about 15 minutes to go from the edge right into the downtown core of the city. So and there are lots of shops and things to do along the way. So it's not a very long walk. Um, apparently now that they've Im implemented this program over the last little while, it's paid big dividends for them because not only are their carbon dioxide emissions down 70 percent seven zero percent in the downtown core that's huge um, but they've actually grown the city they've added 12,000 new residents um, the small businesses are thriving now in the downtown area where you know um, they used to be big box stores and stuff like that would come in well they're not existence in, in this area and shopping malls Cars are permitted under special circumstances, like for weddings or funerals or something like that. There are instances which they're allowed for short periods of time. And it's obviously paid dividends, both economically and environmentally. Good luck, and I'm glad to see that that city's doing well. One of the things I get asked a lot when I go see people and talk to people about EVs is range. What kind of range do they have? And that old range anxiety tends to creep in a little bit until you start talking to people about the advantages and that really is range anxiety there well there's there's a company in the uk that did a survey recently and they surveyed 500 uh, ev owners and they basically looked at their average weekly commutes over a couple a week time period so they talked about uh, the they they surveyed them for uh, their uh, their going back and forth to work commutes and then of course stay at home moms or people dropping kids off to school and that kind of those kind of runs and you know it they combined of about 89 miles a week when you look at all that for an average use and of course that's a well within a daily range of all uh, pretty well all battery electric vehicles out there now I think even the smart EV uh, will do 89 miles or at least pretty close to it anyway um, and and this is a weekly number not a daily number that the survey had picked up so um, you know I think once once people who are starting to investigate EVs look at their daily driving habits and their weekly driving habits and I think they, they get this perception that they've, they've got to be charging it all the time and they're going to go out where they're going to charge it. Well, you know, most of the trips, a high vast majority of the trips that you're going to go on in a daily basis are going to be well within the range of your, your miles uh, of your, your charge that you have. So 
And now, of course, with with uh, with EVs becoming even higher mileage ranges, like we're seeing 250, we're seeing 300 miles now for the Konas and the Hyundai. Of course, Model 3 uh, long range takes the trophy with uh, about uh, 300 miles, 310 miles, by basically, and maybe slightly more. Um, that's more than enough for pretty well anybody's daily range, and it starts to get into really making long trips a very nice experience. So, you know, next time you're talking to people about about EVs, I'm asking them, you know, what is your daily range? What is your weekly? range what kind of driving habits do you do and uh, give them some numbers back here well i talked about range anxiety but of course we do know that we do have to recharge our battery electric vehicles at some point in time but it'd be nice if we never have to recharge them just infinite power here at, we don't see that uh, right now. So uh, talk about a couple of charging uh, station um, announcements that I had read. Uh, one of them is a Nissan is looking to expand the charging network in Spain. Um, Spain isn't a huge adopter of EVs. They're slowly creeping up. They've only got about 1% of the European market share, according to the numbers that I have here. But, um, you know, they are continuing to roll out EV uh, initiatives to spur adoption. Well, Nissan, together with an organization called Easy Charge, um, is adding a, uh, a one, high, sorry, they're placing 100 new charging stations every 150 kilometers or about 90 miles on the motorways in Spain. And they're going to do this within the next year, year and a half time frame. Now, not sure, according to the article that I read, whether they're going to be AC or DC, probably DC, but you know, who knows what happens there. Uh, and just as an FYI, Nissan has already installed about 117 charging stations in Spain uh, and those have been pretty well mostly at their dealerships and that's typically where you where you have a leaf deal, a dealer that sells a leaf they'll have at least one charging station there for public use uh, for, for owner use so uh, anyway good to see uh, more expansion in, in other parts of Europe other than what we've been hearing in some of the bigger countries that where adoption is going even faster so glad to see that uh, things are growing in Spain now on that same note uh, in the UK, going back to the UK, which I've talked about is pretty well one of the leaders in EV adoption. They've been going crazy for quite a while, quite some time. Well, I do hear rumblings from some of my friends on the YouTube uh, chat that we have going all the time of issues with some of the chargers. Uh, EV adoption is becoming quite free, uh, prevalent in the UK, and sometimes the chargers aren't working a lot, and it's a pain to have to try to find another one because they're they're pretty busy out there. Well, there's another company called Instavolt, which is looking to get your dollars or your pounds uh, for your charging uh, needs in the UK. Um, they just celebrated their 200th fast charger installed. Um, so that's interesting because they only launched about 12 months ago and they've been able to roll out 200 uh, DC fast chargers, which is fantastic. Um, they are actually now becoming one of the biggest players in the DC charging segment in the UK. Um, and they stand at more than 1,800 in the entire country um, of, of, from a, a full charging network. Uh, obviously, these will be smaller, probably level two chargers. Um, but it's it's pretty interesting. Now, in the UK, there are um, over 10,900 charging points in that country. Uh, and um, that includes uh, over 1,800 fast chargers. So there's certainly growing that network and uh, good to see that there's there's more choice for uk drivers to to get around on their evs so glad to hear that kind of news now a quick update on the u.s tax credit situation we know that tesla has already come and gone and they've they've passed the 200th uh, vehicle delivered in the u.s so that 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 tax a federal tax credit is now in the phase out period but there's still a few other manufacturers that haven't clipped that level yet and i'll talk about the top five that haven't uh, no, bmw hasn't they've only delivered over seventy seven thousand electrified bmws since the program inception so they got a long way to go toyota with just oh, almost ninety one thousand electrified units uh, i guess that's their their prius hybrids um, that they've delivered. Ford is uh, at 110,000, uh, almost 111,000 now, so they've got a long way to go to reach the phase out. Nissan still has a long way to go at 125,000 and change. Um, General Motors now, they are the next one that we, uh, that I see is going to hit the phase out period. They're at 196,000, just, just shy of 197,000 uh, EV cars, so electrified vehicles sold in the U.S. Um, so about 3,000 shy 
Um, being that this is the end of October, these numbers were calculated. So being that there's a couple of months left and the bolt seems to be on the rise for sales and the volt is still doing well, I do anticipate that they're going to hit that 200 level before the end of this calendar year. So if you're interested in buying a Chevy, be it the Bolt or the Volt, and you'll want to take advantage of the U.S. T federal tax credit that's still in play for that, depending on, again, it does depend on income and the type of car and everything that you buy. But if you qualify for something, you may want to, to not wait any longer and get into that GM electrified vehicle before the end of the year, because I'm afraid that the U.S. tax credit phase out will apply, will happen there. Now, I know that there's things going on in the government and the midterms just finished a couple of days ago and the dust hasn't settled for there from that. So I don't know what's going to happen when it comes to some of the the bills that are on the floor for pro uh, EVs to extend the, the programs or other bills that I've talked about that are that are looking to shrink them and take them away. There's all kinds of stuff going on there and I've had a lot of comments over the last couple of shows about that and I appreciate those comments. Thank you very much. So I really don't know what's going to happen, but it's one of those things that, the, in this case, the manufacturer is going to hit that phase out level. Yes, there was a, there was some talk as well about extending the phase out to more of a time based, uh, maybe a, for another few years versus a number. But you know, until anything happens, folks, the program is what the program is, and we learned the hard way here in Ontario when our new government came in and, and cut the program within a couple of month period, and people were scrambling to try to get cars, uh, EVs to, to be able to qualify for this program. And there's a lot of people that I talk to now that have missed out on that program because they just didn't pull the trigger fast enough and didn't didn't look to uh, to purchase a, an EV when the incentives are still around. So if, if this is uh, important to you, that I would uh, look at making a decision, at least if it's a GM decision, relatively soon. So I mentioned that Tesla reached the phase out period, but they uh, now when we look at outside of the U.S., of course their sales are still doing well. They had a, we talked I talked about the uh, the quarterly report a couple of shows ago, so I won't get into that. But there was an announcement that they do plan on now starting to deliver Model Threes. These are right-hand drive, sorry, left-hand drive units, not right-hand drive. They're the normal left-hand drive units in March of 2019. These will be the long-range models. They will not be the standard range, at least to the information that I've been able to see. Um, and they should start uh, taking deliveries there. There there, there have been some emails and contact that have been sent out to uh, Chinese reservationists who are looking for their Model 3 that the they should be receiving configuration emails soon within the next few weeks. Uh, probably by the end of the year, maybe early January is probably a safe bet for that, for the configuration emails. But hey, if there's anybody uh, that knows anybody in China that has a reservation for Model 3 and that gets one of these emails to configure and place their order, please send me an email or let me know in the comments. I'd love to keep uh, keep uh, up to what's going on there in China. And uh, just remember now, and this is, uh, Tesla expects big sales in China. You know, we know that sales are booming and I don't talk a lot about about specifically China sales because it's huge. It's it's basically, uh, they're, they're half the world right there from a, from a adoption perspective. There's a lot going on. But even though with those high adoption numbers, Tesla still expects uh, the Model 3 to do very well. And that's after this this whole import tax thing that's going on now. In fact, the 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 clients in China that are that are going to buy a Model Three, um, they're going to have to pay a forty percent import tax, four zero percent, folks. That's quite a lot, um, and that was only twenty five percent. Well, I shouldn't say only because even twenty five percent is a big tax in my book, and that's before uh, all these import duties and and tariffs and wars and all this stuff happened between the U.S. and China. So. Um, we'll see what happens. We'll see how Tesla reports earnings, uh, you know, in the, in the third quarter, I guess. I'm trying to remember probably for next year once Chinese sales get going, see what happens there. But uh, at least it's good to see the Model 3 getting out to the rest of the world. And again, when I get information on the right hand drive stuff for my UK folks and uh, friends and, and friends in Australia, New Zealand and other countries, I will certainly let you know um, what happens. Quick update on Mercedes. I've already talked about their first entry into the all-electric market, the EQC SUV that they're coming out with. Well, the quick update to that story is that they do plan on meeting the uh, production targets uh, in the mid-2019 time frame is when production is supposed to start. Their battery supplier or their plant that's building the batteries um, 
uh, has already produced more than 200,000 batteries. Uh, these are lithium ion based batteries technologies, of course, and uh, they do anticipate with that uh, with that load that they've already got that that storage of batteries and the increasing production. So they should be able to start production on the full line of the vehicles in the spring of 2019. I guess they're waiting for some other things, uh, but it's good to know that Mercedes is at least uh, getting into the game and they, they don't seem to be slowing down as far as their timelines. For the EQC, I do expect it to be a wonderful SUV to be very nice, but it's not going to be cheap, of course, as I've mentioned on a previous show. But uh, glad to hear that things are moving forward for Mercedes. And last but not least on this quick episode of uh, EV Revolution show, I've got this story. I talked about electric boats before and ferries. I think in Norway is one of the first companies and no surprise there that have an all electric ferry. Well, here I'm proud to say in Canada that, yay, we're finally getting to the all electric, well, almost all electric ferry uh, game here in Ontario. Actually, we're going to have uh, two um, ferries that are going to hit the uh, the waters uh, beginning in 2020. They're going to go in operation here. There, these particular ferries are operated by the Ministry of Transportation for Ontario, or what we call the MTO, their provincial government agency. And these are a couple of ferries uh, that are going to go into operation. One is going to do an Amherst Island run, and the other one is Wolf Island. And this is in the area of uh, Lake Ontario and the Saint Lawrence River areas where these ferries operate here in Ontario. The Amherst Island Ferry will have a length of 68 meters and a width of 25 meters, which can accommodate 300 people and 42 cars. The Wolf Island Ferry, which will go in operation in 2021, will have a length of 98 meters and a width of 25 meters to hold about 400 people and 75 cars. Um, now, the, I said almost all electric because both of these ferries will be powered mainly from batteries, but they will have a diesel engine as a backup. And I guess that makes sense. You don't want to be out in the middle of, of your of your crossing, wherever you're going from the ferry island uh, or back to the mainland, whatever, and all of a sudden run out of juice. That would be kind of not very safe. So they're going to have a diesel backup to ensure continued mobility to at least get them to the uh, end of uh, end of the line. Now, operational speeds for these ferries are going to be about 12 knots or 13.8 miles per hour or 22.2 kilometers per hour. Aha, got all the numbers for you on that time, which matches conventional uh, propulsion. They're going to be uh, powered by up to four 550 kilowatt um, motors. Uh, I, they don't say what kind of motors they are, but certainly that's going to be more than enough power to get them going. Now, I think the kicker to this is that they anticipate that these ferries, once operational, will help reduce emissions to the equivalent of 7 million kilograms of carbon dioxide per year. And that's what we like to hear, or that's what I like to hear on the EV Revolution show, is that reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from wherever they come from, folks. And boy, thank you a lot from a lot of comments on my last show about the greenhouse gas uh, stories. Man, did I get a a lot of comments and I'm, I'm very thankful for that you know that's always great to see and, and and read so and respond so with that note i want to thank everybody for tuning into this episode of episode 19 that's it it was a quick and fast one folks as always uh, please if you have comments and and i do love to hear from them send me an email you can email me at evrevolutionshow at gmail.com don't forget i'm on twitter as well which i try to keep updated uh, at EV Rev Show is my Twitter handle. Of course, you're watching this on YouTube, most likely, so don't forget to hit that bell. First, subscribe if you can. I'd love it if you did, and then hit that bell. You get automatically notified when I push an episode up. And if you don't know already, I do do audio podcasts. In fact, I'm going to record my next one tomorrow. Well, by the time you see this show, it might be a couple of days earlier, so whatever. You know, I don't want to do a time warp thing. It's just going to mess people's brains up now. But I'm going to record an audio podcast very, very soon, and soon, and I'll have that out. I'm excited. It'll be a guest from the U.S. talking about EVs in the city and all this kind of stuff. I'm excited to to have her on the show. But of course, you can listen to the audio podcasts through iTunes, through your podcast app, uh, through Google Play, um, through TuneIn Radio, and through Spotify. Now I'm on that as well. And last but not least, as always, a big thank you and shout out to my Patreon supporters. Really appreciate you guys and gals for supporting me to, uh, in these efforts of keeping the EV Revolution show going and be able to grow content and, and grow my sphere of knowledge in the EV world. Thank you for that. And if you haven't 
you don't know what Patreon is, you want to find a little bit more and you're interested in maybe uh, helping me out, you can go to www.patreon.com forward slash EV Revolution Show. Check out my page there. And if you'd like to subscribe to uh, support me, that would be great. Even a dollar uh, a month. Yes, a dollar a month. I think I said a dollar a day last time, but even a dollar a month. So that's definitely less than a coffee a month. Now I got my story straight on that. So anyway, thanks for tuning in, folks. And until next time, please, everybody stay safe and uh, take care. And we'll see you then.